the first step in any Mars lizard breeding project is to make sure you have one of each sex. Well, that's not completely true. In recent years, we've discovered that at least some species can produce viable eggs in the absence of a male through a process called parthenogenesis. Realistically though, one can't rely on that, and it's better to make sure you have a pair before you start. I should point out that even if you have only one monitor and have no interest in finding a mate for it, it's still important to know its sex because unpaired females will often go through reproductive cycles and may produce eggs, whether or not they're viable. This means your female will need appropriately set up nesting areas in which to lay those eggs. The reproductive failure of lone females which haven't been offered proper nesting options is probably the biggest killer of adult female monitors in captivity. What I'm going to explore in this video is a number of different techniques one can use to determine whether a monitor is male or female. But before we go any further, let's start by looking at the reproductive anatomy, or wedding tackle, of male and female monitors. You may have been noticed by now that monitors, like other reptiles but unlike many mammals, do not have externally visible genitals. Which is of course part of the reason they're difficult to sex. Males have a pair of organs tucked away in the base of their tail called hemipenes. The singular is hemipenis. When not in use, these organs rest inside out in the base of the tail. Picture the finger of a rubber glove turned inside out. When mating, however, they are everted. Unlike the finger of this glove, though, the hemipenes are forked and elaborately decorated with assorted ridges and frills, and usually end in a pair of hardened cartilaginous structures called hemibacula. Hemipenes are scary looking enough that you wouldn't want to be a female monitor. They're also weird looking enough for gullible people in some parts of the world to have developed fanciful ideas about their medicinal qualities. So here's a fun fact. The size and shape of the hemipenes, as well as the pattern of ridges and frills, are species specific. So they're used by scientists as a means of species identification. Because of this, museum specimens are often preserved with the hemipenes sticking out. The equivalent female structures are called hemiclitori. These are smaller than hemipenes, but the size and shape may vary between species. In general though, they lack the fancy accessories of the hemipenes, aren't forked, and usually have a blunt end. The rest of a monitor's reproductive system is hidden inside its body cavity. In males, this mainly consists of a pair of testes. Females, on the other hand, have ovaries. along with a pair of convoluted tubes called oviducts. We'll discuss these in other videos later in the series. For now, the only important thing to know is that none of these reproductive organs is visible externally, as I'd mentioned earlier. The lack of externally visible reproductive organs doesn't always make it difficult to sex reptiles, as some do display what is known as sexual dimorphism. Sexual dimorphism, from the Greek words for two forms, is what it is called when males and females look different from each other. A good example of obvious sexual dimorphism in a lizard is the Namibian rock agama. A few years ago I was watching these very differently colored agamids running around a rocky outcrop in Namibia and it took a few minutes for to register that they belong to the same species. Females and juveniles look like this, whereas mature males look like this. Australian water dragons aren't as extreme in their sexual dimorphism but are still fairly easy to tell apart. Unfortunately, most monitors lack obvious sexual dimorphism and can be quite difficult to sex. After seeing the Namibian rock agama and Australian water dragon, look at this pair of lace monitors and you can see that it's a bit trickier to tell them apart. There are a handful of monitors with different levels of sexual dimorphism, such as subtle coloration differences, the size of the spur-like scales on either side of the tail base, or even the extent of staining on the bottom of the hind feet in some species but finding an easy general rule that applies to most species of monitor is more difficult. Many species do show quite dramatic sexual dimorphism in size. In lace monitors and parentes, for example, it is common for adult males to weigh two to four times as much as adult females. However, relying on this can produce a false negative. What I mean by false negative is that while we can say that monitors above a certain size are likely to be male, we can't assume that a monitor below that size threshold is a female, because it could be a young male that is still growing, or even just a small male. You're going to discover that false negatives are a common problem with sexing monitors. 
Most young monitors look like females until they reach a certain age or size, at which point they start to develop male features. What this means is that while we can say that the individuals which have developed the male features are almost certainly male, those that lack those features aren't necessarily female, as they could still be males which have yet to develop. The older and larger the animal is, the less likely it is to get false negatives. So the lesson here is that it is easier to sex adult monitors than it is juveniles. When I first started thinking about this video series, I was going to make this particular video on sexy monitors short, and just explain the techniques that I use with my monitors at home. But then I decided to expand on the topic and cover quite a wide variety of techniques. I'll even cover some techniques that I don't think are particularly useful, or which are useful but unlikely to be used by most private keepers for a variety of reasons, just so you know what options are out there. Some of the techniques I'll be covering are somewhat invasive, involving inserting something into the monitor's body, whereas others are not. Some of the techniques will require a vet visit, and others involve things you can observe at home. It may take me a while to get through them, so please be patient as I'll be leaving the techniques that I normally use until the very end. I should also point out that although I may provide pros and cons for some sexing techniques, for the most part I will not be passing judgment on the different techniques, because most of them have their time and place. What is suitable for one person's situation may not be suitable for someone else's. Clearly there are two areas in which one can look to determine the sex of a monitor. We can try to look for testes or ovaries within the body cavity, or we can look for hemipenes in the tail base. Most sexing techniques involve looking for hemipenes, but I'll start with the two that don't, the two that involve looking for ovaries or testes. The first technique is an invasive technique called laparoscopy. Laparoscopy involves making a tiny slit in the monitor's abdomen and then inserting a laparoscope, which is a thin tube with a light and a tiny camera so you can look for testes or ovaries. This will give you a 100% positive identification of sex as long as the monitor is large enough that the reproductive organs can be distinguished visually. But you'd probably only want to do it with a reasonable sized animal anyway. This requires a vet visit, of course, and the monitor needs to be sedated. Although the slit usually tends to heal quickly, there's always a chance of a small amount of surgical scarring. Laparoscopy is not the sort of thing the average hobbyist gets done unless it is absolutely crucial for them to know the sex of their monitor immediately. A non-invasive way to look for ovaries or testes is to use ultrasound. You've all seen those images of human fetuses taken with ultrasound through the pregnant mother's abdomen. Well, the same technology can also be used to look inside the abdomen of a monitor to look for ovaries or testes. Testes come up as small, smooth-edged, bean-shaped objects whereas ovaries come up as more granular because of the follicles. The monitor needs to be a reasonable size for these to be distinguishable, but it needn't be a full-size adult. Ultrasound just requires a visit to an experienced vet with ultrasound equipment of the appropriate resolution. Most of the rest of the techniques I'll cover involve looking for hemipenes. The most straightforward of these is to, well, wait for it, wait until you see hemipenes. What I mean by this is that uh, some male monitors will avert their hemipenes when they defecate. Others will do it if they're frightened of humans and are picked up. That's particularly common with wild monitors. This very young Belfay's lace monitor let me know his sex when he tried to mate with a glove which carried the scent of other lace monitors. No, I wasn't doing anything untoward with my finger, just pushing his tail base to one side so I can get a clear photograph. Here you get an idea of the fancy frills one might find on a hemipenis. But this photograph is not fully erect, because when fully averted you can see the hard hemibacula at the tips of the forked hemipenis looking sort of like human teeth in this photograph. If you happen to see your monitor revert its hemipenes, it's great, because then you know with 100% certainty that you have a male. However, not seeing your monitor's hemipenes doesn't mean it's a female, and this is probably the biggest potential false negative one can get when sexing monitors. For example, a number of years ago, I was talking to a monitor keeper who kept referring to their monitor as a she, even though it looked like a male to me. So I asked how they had sexed it, and they told me that they had never seen it avert hemipenes and assumed it must have been a female. So I'm going to show you how this can fail. This is one of my lace monitors, Alex. Alex is turning 18 this year, and I've had him for pretty much all of those 18 years. Alex has fathered well over 200 babies, so I'm more than a little confident that he's a male, and yet I've never once seen him avert his hemipenes in those 18 years. 
The closest I've got was when a biologist overseas who was doing research on mating systems in lizards wanted a photograph of a monitor's hemipenis inserted into a female's vent. So I got down onto the rug when the lace monitors were mating one morning and lifted Alex's tail to snap this shot. Now there's an image you weren't expecting to see. There's another potential trap with waiting for aversions. If a young male only partially averts its hemipenes, they can sometimes pass for hemiclitori, as the big flowery ends only appear on full aversions. I quite often get asked whether or not you can probe a monitor to see if it has hemipenes. Probing is a technique often used to sex snakes. It involves inserting a clean, blunt or ball-tip metal probe into the animal's vent and down into the base of the tail. The idea being that with males it will slip down into the inverted sheath of the hemipenis, whereas in females it doesn't go in very far. Although this technique does work well with most snakes, it faces a number of issues with monitors. The first issue is that monitors have really strong tail muscles and aren't likely to hold still while you insert a metal probe into their nether regions, so the animal would have to be sedated or you'd risk injury to the monitor and probably yourself. You really do not want to try this at home. But even if you got an experienced reptile vet to do it for you, the results may still be inconclusive, as the hemiclitori in many species of monitor can be quite long, so even if the probe does go in, it may still turn out to be a female. Another technique that works with some snakes and lizards is manual aversion. Manual aversion involves bending the animal's tail back slightly and applying pressure to the base of the tail with a thumb and then pushing forward towards the vent. Lizards have a pair of retractor muscles which pull the hemipenes back into the base of the tail and the idea behind manual aversion is to tire out those muscles and squeeze the hemipenes out. As you can imagine, manual aversion would be extremely difficult with a large monitor. It can sometimes work with very young monitors, but there's some risk of damage to the animal and also a high potential for a false negative. Those that avert a hemipenis are definitely male, but those that don't aren't necessarily female, for they may still be males that haven't averted. Hydrostatic aversion is another technique used to force monitors to avert their hemipenes. This involves using a syringe to inject an inert fluid, like saline solution, into the base of the tail, causing the monitor to avert its hemipenes. As you can imagine, there's a level of risk involved, and it's definitely not something you'd want to try at home. But even if you were to get a vet to do it, you'd want to make sure the vet was quite experienced and the monitor sedated. Earlier I had mentioned that the hemipenes of monitors often have hard tips, called hemibacula. In some species, the hemibacula become calcified as the monitor matures, which means they develop bony elements. Mature males of a number of species can be sexed by taking an x-ray of the monitor's tail base and looking for signs of these ossifications. This adult female lace monitor lacks ossifications. This is what they look like in a male. Taking an x-ray is a relatively easy, non-invasive way of sexing monitors, but the monitor needs to be reasonably mature, for young males lack these ossifications and it's possible to get a false negative. Very young monitors, or even the adults of some of the smaller species, can be sexed by a technique known as hemipenal transillumination. Try saying that quickly. Hemipenal transillumination works a bit like candling an egg. A really bright torch or flashlight is put up against the base of the monitor's tail, and the hemipenes should show up as dark reddish areas. Here's how it looks in a pair of adult stores monitors. And here's how it looks in a pair of juveniles of the same species. This is one of the few techniques that works on very young monitors. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to get it to work with lace monitors because they have an opaque black band covering the area of interest, preventing the light from coming through. The final two techniques I'm going to cover rely on purely visual cues. So they don't require any handling at all, and therefore can often even be used to sex wild monitors without touching them. There is one caveat though, and that is that the monitors usually need to be mature adults, otherwise there's a risk of a false negative again, but the advantage of these techniques is that they are strictly observational and therefore don't require any handling or manipulation, and they also cost nothing. 
The first of these techniques involving visual cues follows on from many of the previous sexing techniques in that we are looking for the evidence of hemipenes. But in this instance, we're merely looking for the effect of the presence of hemipenes on the shape of the tail base in male monitors. When viewed from the side, most large male monitors have visible hemipenal bulges under the base of the tail. They can sometimes be tricky to see in a still photograph, but if you have the monitor in front of you and watch it as it moves around, they may become more obvious. There's also a fair bit of variation between species and even between individuals within any given species, with some males being really obvious, whereas others have barely visible hemipenal bulges. Let's have a look at some random stills of a male lace monitor so I can show you what it is you're looking for. Notice these bulges here. Now let's have a look at some video to see how it appears in a moving animal. And there it is. Now let's compare that with a female starting with some still photographs. Notice that the underside of the tail is much flatter. Sometimes the tail even widens for a bit going back from the base of the tail, unlike the tapering seen in males. And here's some video footage of females walking around. Again, the underside of the base of the tail is quite flat. Now we'll have a look at another species, in this instance, savannah monitors, an African species. Here's a female. And here's a male. The second visual cue, usually used in conjunction with hemipenal bulges, is head shape. Up until now we've been looking at mostly primary sex characteristics. Primary sex characteristics are differences between the sexes in structures directly involved in reproduction. So ovaries, testes, and hemipenes are all considered to be primary sex characteristics, as they are directly involved in reproduction. Secondary sex characteristics, on the other hand, are differences between males and females that are developed at maturity, but which have nothing to do with the reproductive act itself. Classic examples of secondary sex characteristics would be the peacock's fancy rump feathers and the lion's mane, or even the color and body shape differences of the Namibian rockagamas and Australian water dragons I mentioned earlier. Although I said earlier that monitor lizards do not show much sexual dimorphism, other than a size difference between the sexes in some species, there are actually some subtle secondary sex characteristics associated with head shape. What it comes down to is that at maturity, males tend to develop larger, bulkier snouts and jaws relative to the rest of the head, whereas by comparison females have more delicate features than the males, usually with a shorter, narrower snout with a pointier tip. Picking this takes a bit of practice, especially as there is a fair bit of variation between species, but I'll start off by demonstrating what I'm talking about using lace monitors as an example, and we'll then have a quick look at a handful of different species. The best way to start is by getting side-on shots of the head of the animal in question. Here are a couple of photographs of mature male and female lace monitors. The best way to compare them is to have them face in the same direction, so I'll flip one of the heads around. Then we'll want to scale them up to the same size, so the differences aren't lost due to the difference in scale. There are a couple of ways we can standardize the size. The first is to draw a line down the center of the eye and then scale them so they have the same snout length. And when we do this, it becomes clear that the female has larger eyes relative to the size of her head. I prefer to scale them differently so that their eyes are the same size. And once we do that and then flip between them, it's clear that the male has larger, bulkier snout. The differences become particularly clear when we morph between them.
You can see now that the main points of difference are the bulging on the top of the male's snout and the thickness of his lower jaw. To demonstrate this, I'll put an outline on the male's head and then morph back to the female. There's quite a difference there. If you can't get a perfect side-on shot, it's okay if the head is at a slight angle, as long as the male's head is also at the same angle. Here's the same female at a slightly different angle. Again, compared to the male. And here's the same male compared to a different female. This female is a fair bit more mature than the previous female and has a bulkier head than the previous female, but the difference between her and the male is still significant. And here she is again at yet another angle. So how does this work with other monitors, like some of the African species which start off with blockier looking heads? Is there still a difference? Here's a male and female savanna monitor. Although they both have fairly bulky looking heads, note that the male's snout is still slightly longer and bulkier. It also has a thicker lower jaw. These individuals were only a few months old when these photographs were taken, so the differences will become more exaggerated as they mature. Males of the closely related white throat and black throat monitors, Varanus albigularis, develop an extremely exaggerated snout. This white throated monitor photographed in South Africa has a very bulbous snout, even though it wasn't a particularly large individual. While we're looking at wild monitors, let's have a look at another African species, the Nile monitor. It's also a popular one in captivity in some parts of the world. This individual is also photographed in South Africa. It has a relatively slender snout and doesn't seem to have the hemipenal bulges, so it's quite likely a female. Fortunately, I photographed another one not too far away with which to compare it, and this one certainly appears to be developing male features, like a bulkier head and vague hemipenal bulges. The difference between this animal and the earlier one is certainly noticeable. Asian water monitors take a bit of practice, as the males don't get the exaggerated bulbous snouts of some other species, but they do get a noticeably thick lower jaw, with a fair bit of curvature. Let's have a look at a handful of individuals of each sex. The differences seem subtle, but become clear when one directly compares photographs of either sex. Let's compare this female with this male, for example. While we're looking at wild monitors, we've compared captive lace monitors, so let's have a look at some photographs of wild lace monitors to see if we can take a stab at their sex. Here's a male photograph near Sydney, Australia, and you can see its raised snout. Hemipenal bulges can be subtle in lace monitors, but are visible here. Female lace monitors are not commonly seen as they're much shyer than males, but here's a wild female. Note her slender snout and relatively large eyes. The difference in behavior between the sexes is often noticeable in captivity too, with males often being bolder and quicker to habituate to humans than females, but I haven't mentioned it because there are exceptions to the rule, and it also doesn't seem to apply across all species. While talking about behavior, I should also point out that seeing your two monitors mate doesn't necessarily mean you have one of each sex, as two male or two female monitors 
will often go through the mating act as a form of dominance. I'll discuss this in a later video. Of course, I can't verify the sexes of any of these wild monitors, so, so to some extent it's an educated guess, but from what I've seen with captives, there's a reasonable chance of getting it right most of the time. There have been times when I've been able to verify the sex of wild monitors, though. I know that these heath monitors are all females, because I've seen them all in different stages of nesting in termite mounds. I was pretty sure that this individual was male when I first saw it because of its chunkier head and suggestion of hemipenal bulges. When I saw the same individual a year later stealing eggs out of a female's nest, I got a much better look at the hemipenal bulges on its tail base and I'm now pretty certain it's a male. Check this out. Getting back to captive monitors, I should point out that if you have only one monitor and nothing with which to compare it, go online and look at images of other individuals of the same species, especially if you can find some for which the sex was definitely known. It takes a bit of practice to get your eye in, but as I said earlier, it's the method I tend to use to sex my monitors, and it is something you can do at home. One technique I haven't mentioned in this video, as it isn't widely available yet, is DNA sexing. This involves sending a swab or small tissue sample to a lab to look for certain molecular markers. It isn't commonly available yet, but is used by zoos to sex high-profile species such as Komodo dragons. I do, however, suspect that at some point in the future this will become accessible for more and more species. Hopefully this video will have helped you to either find out the sex of your monitor or at very least give you some pointers as to how you can get your monitor sexed by an experienced vet. In the next video, I'm going to describe some husbandry changes you'll need to keep in mind if you do have a pair that you're intending to breed, or even if you have a lone female. In the meantime, don't forget to look at the video description box below the video for additional material relating to the current video, and don't forget to click the subscribe button to receive notifications of when the next video is uploaded. I'll see you then.